uh, thanks for being with us, uh, Chris. Really pleased to have you. And uh, you're going to talk to us about Richard Rorty. You're going to tell us about the American philosopher Richard Rorty. And uh, let's start with a bit of a, the, the who question. Who was Richard Rorty and where did he come from and when did he live? Sure. Uh, Richard McKay Rorty uh, was born in 1931. Uh, he's a North American philosopher, obviously. I think one of the most significant of the last third of the 20th century. Um, his father was James Rorty, an author, a poet, a, a muckraking journalist. His mother was uh, Winifred Rauschenbusch Rorty. And people may be familiar with the Rauschenbusch name uh, because of Rorty's grandfather, Walter Rauschenbusch, the social gospel theologian. So he was really born into quite impressive intellectual bona fides. He was educated first at the University of Chicago um, in 1946, arriving as a 15-year-old and participating in this uh, sort of great books type curriculum that Robert Hutchins had put together there and had classmates like Alan Bloom and Susan Sontag. Because it was such an idiosyncratic program, he was there for only three years and was only 18. <laughs> and it wasn't yet easy to transfer into a graduate program in philosophy. So he stayed at Chicago for a master's degree and then ended up at Yale for his PhD. Uh, he had a brief stint in the army around 1956 to 57, 58. And then he ends up at Princeton University for roughly 20 years, from about 1962 to 1982. And really that 20 year period is where a lot of major things happened to Rorty. In the second half of that two decades, he felt that he was already on the outs with philosophy proper. And he actually never worked in a philosophy department uh, after Princeton. Uh, in 1983, he moved to the University of Virginia, where he held a, a distinguished professorship in the humanities that didn't require departmental service and being a part of an apartment. And he was there for about 15 years, a very productive period in Rorty's output. And then in 1998, he moved to Stanford University, where he taught in a comparative literature department and taught philosophy there. So again, maintaining that distance from mainstream philosophy uh, as a discipline. Yeah, we're going to get to this, I think, that in Rorty, he is a bit of a, an outsider, really, of the the canon, the, the philosophical canon that was imported at the time. That was that loom large. I'm talking about analytic sure. philosophy, Chris. I think, right. So, so for the listeners, that's a, a particular, I guess, iteration of philosophy in the 20th century, especially. And it's characterized by rigor, a focus on language, a focus on proving or disproving uh, scientific statements, really, right. I, I mean, think. Rorty knew how to play the game of analytic philosophy, and he had some original contributions there in the mid-1960s. But I think there was, for a time, a narrative that I think was slightly um, off, and that he was an analytic philosopher who, after being trained as such, lost his faith and becomes converted to pragmatism. But if we look back at his training at Chicago and Yale, the contexts were quite pluralistic, very oriented to the history of philosophy and not mainstays of the analytic tradition. I mean, at the time, Harvard was much more analytic where you find uh, Hilary Putnam and others. So he did get a very broad pluralistic training in philosophy and his early interests included metaphilosophy, speculative metaphysics, and he really was interested in building bridges across philosophical traditions. So we see his early, earliest publications in the early 1960s were about, for example, putting Charles Sanders Peirce, one of the founders of pragmatism, in dialogue with Ludwig Wittgenstein um, and trying to bridge analytic and pragmatist traditions. And, and you see this throughout his career where he really was not at home in a single sort of niche within mainstream philosophy and was constantly pushing against those boundaries. And that's it. That's, that's interesting uh, discussion of the, the phases of his philosophy. And he's very pluralistic. He's as well as American pragmatism, 
which I'll talk to you about presently, as well as analytic philosophy. He's also quite willing to go to what we call continental philosophy or European philosophy, which is he's happy to be reading the Heidegger's, the Foucault's, the Derrida's right. of the this world. This is another one of his distinctive characteristics that he shared with his friend and, and my own teacher, Richard J. Bernstein, who, when I studied pragmatism with Bernstein uh, at the New School in the 1990s, it was seemed perfectly natural to read Jacques Derrida one week and John Dewey the next and, and really see them as in dialogue. And, and that really wasn't the case at all for people who were trained within a single tradition. But you see throughout the 1970s, how Rorty is moving between philosophy and literary criticism and a really broad intellectual stable of interlocutors that he finds inspiration from, finds resources in. And, you know, he knew how to play the analytic game and he, he did it well. Um, but he also was much broader than that and really felt quite strongly that the history of philosophy was very important in, in the training of philosophers, and he preferred to do that uh, throughout his career. Let's talk a little bit about Rorty's pragmatism. European listeners might not be as familiar with what pragmatism actually is. So it's a distinct style of doing philosophy. It's a uniquely American way of doing philosophy as well, I think. And I think some of the key figures are people who a lot of people would have heard about, but maybe not perhaps in aggregate. People like William James, perhaps the varieties of religious experience would be a book people that would, might have read by William James who might not read any philosophy. Or there's folk like John Dewey, who is perhaps, actually is perhaps one of the most influential philosophers of the 20th century, or ever really, because of his, 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 his influence on education uh, and educational theory and pedagogy. And you've also the semiotician, uh, Charles Purse. My question for you, Chris, is how is Rorty sitting with regard to American pragmatism? What is he taking from it and how is he deviating yeah, from sure. it? Yeah, sure. This is really one of the the biggest questions about Rorty. And part of his reception involved both a generating a resurgence of interest in pragmatism, perhaps, you know, as a result of his 1979 book, Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature, which we can talk about. But there's the narrative about pragmatism, at least one of the dominant narratives, was that comes about in the last decades of the 19th century with William James primarily promoting ideas of Charles Sanders' purse that were quite technical and really buried in some obscure philosophical journals. William James popularizes it around 1898. Peirce takes issue with James's reading of his philosophy and decides he wants to define something distinct. And so he calls it pragmaticism rather than pragmatism, term he thought is so ugly that it would be safe from kidnappers in a famous line. <laughs> but then we get uh, John Dewey and the pragmatist tradition really goes into a kind of eclipse around the Second World War with the rise of the Vienna Circle, analytic philosophy logical empiricism and a much more technical, rigor rigorous and logic based philosophy. Not not that the pragmatists didn't do this. I mean Person and Dewey both had strong contributions to logic. But the pragmatists who were the colleague of mine likes to say pre disciplinary, they were viewed as too muddled, too all over the map. I mean William James is writing about religious experience. Dewey is writing about education and psychology, as well as philosophy proper. And it's really as a result of Rorty's work that pragmatism comes back to the, the center stage, if you will. But at the same time, there's a backlash because Rorty's version of pragmatism to many, particularly in, in the U.S., who had been studying the classical pragmatists, so-called Peirce, James Dewey, Josiah Royce, um, felt that Rorty had misconstrued, misunderstood, or distorted the pragmatists. So there was a backlash against Rorty within American philosophy. So we can sort of dig into the particularities of where he differs, but I think the the broadest way that I would characterize the distinctiveness of his pragmatism is that he really brings pragmatism up to date in a way with intellectual developments that 
came after this so-called classical period where the linguistic turn in analytic philosophy that starts to center on language. Um, he had a Deweyan sense of the importance of philosophy for democracy. Um, I think that's an important continuity where in Dewey's phrase, he sought to reconstruct philosophy to bring it in service of democratic ideals and the social and moral problems of the day, rather than merely the technical uh, debates that are only of interest to professional philosophers. So you get a broad orientation that reacts to the Cartesian spirit of modern philosophy that brings in historicism and the importance of context and really rejects the idea that philosophy exists in this kind of neutral matrix that is outside of culture and history. And of course, the common denominator of pragmatism is that it has to be, well, obviously pragmatic. I take that to mean it has to be practical. You know, philosophy is meaningless if it's not really about concrete, practical things. And, it, and there's, I suppose, the anti-Platonism in Rorty. What does Plato do? He, he endorses two things. He endorses a, a, an abstract world of forms, which is the ground of reality. And Plato also, and this is what Rorty would find objectionable, is in The Republic, famously, he talks about specialization, that truth is in some way connected to expertise. And Rorty does not like that at all. He, he doesn't like that abstraction. He doesn't like that neutral faux disinterestedness. In some sense, philosophy is always, and pragmatism is always, very much in the world. It's one of the things he has in common with the phenomenological That's tradition. That's right. I think, you know, it's interesting. Rorty had this essay that was discovered several decades after he wrote it called The Philosopher's Expert. And it was published in a, a second edition of Philosophy and Mirror of Nature book when it, it was re-released. And there, it's, it's a very early essay from the early 1960s, but he does suggests there is a role for technicism and expertise in professional philosophy, but it's primarily for figuring out which problems we need to let go of as philosophers. And well, it's a very Wittgensteinian, yeah, you're right. Exactly. So he thinks there is a role there, but for the most part, you're right. I mean, he, even with Dewey, um, he reacted to what he saw is this bifurcation where sometimes Dewey tried to write as if he were a neutral theoretician, but other times he was quite explicitly writing as, you know, a citizen of democracy at a particular time and place and seeking to address problems. And he really thought that was the model for philosophy as opposed to the neutral detached matrix of inquiry. This brings us, I think, to, I suppose, a transitional text, but also one of his more major works on epistemology, which you alluded to already, which is Philosophy and the Mirror of Nature. And I'm hoping perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that. Now, the the title tells us a lot. Uh, Philosophy and the Mirror of Nature. He always had good titles, Rorty. Uh, so the idea is that, I think it's in the title, the idea is uh, philosophy should, in some sense, give us a replica or a mirror of what the natural world is. The task of philosophy is, I suppose this is Nagel's term, but to attain a view from nowhere or a truth which transcends all. Whereas Rorty, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, it reminds me of the X-Files. You know, remember, I don't know, you were probably of a similar <laughs> age. The X-Files was always David Jukovny things about, about aliens yeah. and that was always over the over the, 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 the credits was the truth is out there. Well, Rorty says the truth isn't out there, in fact. It cannot exist independently of the human mind. And it's because of language and language is always mediated and uh, the world out there is not actually language, but it's our descriptions of the world. And what he's asking, arguing for, I think, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong in my little summary here, Chris, but he's he's asking us for asking us to think about well, how does he put it uh, to have a more sort of pluralistic sense of how knowledge is constructed? Or uh, he talks about a richer vein of uh, vocabulary, our vocabulary. Yes, even. I think you're exactly right. I mean that book, Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature, really sets itself against this idea, as he puts it there, that quote to know is to represent accurately what is outside the mind and have it, you know, mirrored in the mind. And what Rorty does there, I mean, there's several strands, but a big strand is showing that this metaphor of the mirror and the attempt to polish the mirror as 
the path to knowledge he shows is really not something woven into the way things are or woven into human nature, but rather the product of particular conceptions that can be traced to a certain period of time and that they are rather than necessary or determined, they're contingent and they could easily have been otherwise. So it really is this profound anti-Cartesian, anti-Kantian critique of the whole foundationalist and representationalist project of modern epistemology and metaphysics. So the book shows that these influential conceptions of mind, of philosophy, and, and of knowledge characteristic of that tradition simply are metaphors that have captivated philosophers for too long, and that once we free ourselves from these metaphors and or vocabularies, if you like, to adopt others, will give up the idea that the mind is a mirror of reality and that knowledge is merely an assemblage of accurate representations and that philosophy is something that will offer us, you know, privileged access to reality. If we give up all those things, we can imagine different assumptions and a different conception of philosophy that for Rorty, and, and this is where he's aligning with Dewey, can be put in the service of human needs rather than trying to, you know, establish this relation to non-human reality. And this gets him a lot of flack, doesn't it? This book in particular. I mean, it was one of the things about Rorty that our listeners should know of. <laughs> I mean, never has there been a philosopher criticized more, probably. And I think I'd mean that. I think even more than like, uh, say, someone like Derrida, because, you know, someone like Derrida, Foucault, you go, oh, yeah, that, it's, it's what my old professor, who was quite sort of very clever, nice man, but what he used to call dancing on the left bank. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Whereas like, you know, you can't go, okay, that's that's kind of French, that's kind of strange over there. But Rorty, like he takes it from he takes critique from the analytics, he takes it from the continentals, he takes it from literary theories, that in some way he's he's really gets people's goat up. And I suppose the reason for that is that philosophy of the mirror of nature is seen as a a relativist text, both epistemologically and Ethically, so epistemologically, for the listeners, epistemological relativism is the idea that we can't really know anything about anything. So all truth is all truth propositions are equally valid. The claim that uh, I know Paris is in France is as true as the fact that I'm going to win the next gold medal in the hundred meter sprint at the Olympics, right? Or and then there's a moral relativism, which is the idea that uh, all moral claims are equally valid, and you know, we can make no moral justification for anything. Now. I don't, that's that's what he's accused of, and I know you must have thought about this, uh, and uh, as Rorty did himself. How? What do you think? What was his response to this critique? And I should let listeners know as well. He's quite a number one. He's a great he's a great writer, but he's also quite funny. Uh, he's quite sort of can be quite sardonic, and uh, he can kind of be quite funny and witty and dismissive of those who are engaging with him. But I suppose that's my question to you, then, Chris. What are his responses to these accusations of? Oh, nihilism, skepticism, yeah, relativism. Yeah, that, that was certainly um, a charge that was leveled uh, often at Rorty. You know, he even wrote an essay called What to Do When They Call You a Relativist. <laughs> but his line was that, and he had, as you, as you point out, many witticisms. And I think that's in part why, even though philosophy in the mirror of nature was viewed quite uh, negatively from within the discipline of philosophy. I mean, he was known as this sort of Trojan horse of analytic philosophy who had the insider knowledge to know where the weaknesses are and who ultimately exploited it from within. And he had lines like, you know, one philosopher's truth is another's category mistake and all kinds of funny um, things. But in terms of relativism, he tried to sort of disarm that charge by pointing out that Relativism only makes sense as part of a binary that includes some form of absolutism or transcendentalism that involves getting out of the particularities of culture and history. And once you give up on that, you know, the Platonic project, as you noted, of sort of getting outside of the cave to find wisdom, relativism loses its force as a charge. So he, he took that angle, but he also had another argument, which is simply, it's one thing to say that every culture or every belief is as good as every other. And he consistently rejected that that's what he was doing. But he said, it is something else to simply say, we need to start from where we are as historically and culturally constituted beings. And that 
locates us in a particular time and place, but it doesn't mean that we still can have pragmatically informed conceptions of truth and, and objectivity and representation that are just understood um, not as transcending language, but existing within a particular set of linguistic uh, commitments or a particular vocabulary, or even, you know, on this Wittgensteinian view of language, that a particular form of life, that it needs to be in place for us to have a language to philosophize in the first place. Yeah, and that's really interesting then, Chris, because that begs the question then, what is the form of the human being that does all this? And he does have a theory of, I suppose, psychology, if you like, how human beings interact with the world. And in some sense, we're very preoccupied with truth. We're very preoccupied with navigating our way through the world. But in some sense, what we are is beings that are, we define ourselves, or we are beings that engage in acts of redescription. That's the key. That's what we are. That's the truth of the human being. And I think that's that's what you write about in your own work, isn't it? That reconstructed sense of pragmatism that Rorty is trying to do. He's trying to give an articulation to a very different type of individual that we get with philosophy, where it's, or with traditional philosophy, and analytic philosophy, right. Plato and all that. It's the idea that the human being is yes, neutral. Yes, I mean, the idea of redescription, I think, is, is very right. important for Rorty. And he offers that as an alternative to the we can call it a Kantian conception of philosophy that identifies it as a privileged discipline that has access to reality that isn't available under other disciplinary orientations. And one way that I think Rorty talks about this that's very helpful is the difference between vertical and horizontal metaphors, that the vertical metaphors are the ones that see philosophy as a way to either transcend and get outside uh, human particularity by uh, getting out of the cave on Plato's metaphor, or go below to some sort of ahistorical foundation or human nature or something that is um, outside of the particularities that constitute humans and that lead to a sort of relativism. So he rejected the horizontal, uh, the vertical metaphors for horizontal ones where we can have different interpretations. And this this also, I think, is another example of the pluralism you mentioned, that we don't need to see as getting any you know higher or lower on the vertical metaphor or getting closer to reality or truth. So he uses examples from literature or film or art where you can have an interpretation of the Cormac McCarthy novel, for example, and then you can have a subsequent interpretation and then someone will criticize that. And these things can coexist on a horizontal plane and each one illuminate different things about the novel, but we don't take any of them to be penetrating to the core of what the novel really is outside of human interpretation. So there's no essence, right. Or if there is, we have no neutral way of accessing it that is not going to utilize our linguistic, cultural, historical forms of life that we, you know, exist within. What I want to ask you about next, then, is the connection between epistemology and value. His epistemology is a type of pluralism. You know, that is all these competing perspectives, even antagonistic perspectives, and we need to draw these together in order to come to the greatest approximation of truth possible, I suppose, rather than say that there's one truth with a capital T out there. But that then very much maps onto an ethical pluralism, right? That he's, he thinks that uh, it's not only good <laughs> that, we th that we have plural values, but it's also desirable as well. It's a desirable state for the world that we ought to, to, to pursue. So it's quite a, a liberal idea. And he's, he's, a, he's a very distinctive type of sure. liberal, Sure, so think. there's, right, there's the epistemology piece, and then we can get into the ethics and the liberalism. You know, as we said, I mean, Rorty views human beings as already normatively uh, oriented to the world based on the form of life that we live in. You know, there's one contemporary reader of Rorty, uh, Susan Dealman, who put it this way, you know, that... Um, likening Rorty's epistemology to that of feminist epistemologists. And it's basically that he reverses the priority of epistemology over community. 
that for Rorty, rather than being a way to transcend community, community comes first. So our ideas about mind, language, culture, what have you, are really just expressions of the moral and epistemic communities that we are already a part of. Now, the place where Rorty resists relativism is that his view of community is this liberal one that is always kind of questioning its limits. And he, he used the word irony to describe this orientation to one's most fundamental uh, commitments, that we can view them as being historically contingent, uh, in other, you know, not woven into the way things are or human nature, but also be willing to fight and die for them. And yet be curious about other communities and other beliefs. So that is the, the irony that's there that really, I think, is at home in a pluralistic understanding of values, that we always want to be thinking about the limitations of values and trying to learn from others who have different value commitments. And I think that's the, the orientation of his, his liberalism, one that is at home with pluralism and committed to its liberal values, which we can get into what that means for Rorty, but also understanding that there are partialities and limitations built in that we can only get outside, not by transcending language or community, but by learning from other cultures and their values. So truth is a matter of the things we do in community rather than something abstract and disinterested. So truth, epistemology is morality, basically, and vice versa for Rorty, because uh, the truth comes from a community of inquirers building consensus and just figuring things out as they go along. I think that's life. right. And, and this is something that he shares with William James. The idea that our, our criteria for truth or epistemic criteria really are a species of moral and uh, features of the good that we take and not something distinct. So that even when we talk about the values that we want to affirm is true or right or correct, that's not independent of our commitments to a certain conception of a moral or ethical good. And that's, you know, quite controversial and distinctive, I think. But I think that was Rorty's stance. And one of the best explanations he gave was in this response to reviews of Philosophy and Mayor of Nature right after it came out in 1979, where he was on a panel with Ian Hacking and Jaeguan Kim. And their, their critiques of Rorty were published, but his response wasn't until recently. And what he says there is, you know, he was being accused of, quote, socializing truth, making truth merely a matter of social consensus or approval. And he said, rather than socializing truth, it would be more accurate to say, quote, like James and Dewey, I am trying to moralize truth. <laughs> um, so Gosh. I think you're right in, in picking up on that. The other, just to slightly, slightly shift tack, he is usually seen as a postmodernist as well. And I know I've, that's just bringing in another term to have to explain. But the short had postmodernism was, I suppose, an anti essentialist form of philosophy and f form of art as well, typified by the work of, sort of three big French thinkers uh, Jean Francois Lyotard, Jacques Derrida, and Michel Foucault. And Rorty is the American version of that. How, I'm not sure how fair that is, but that's usually how it's, that's how, that's how the story is told. You get, you got these, these uh, three uh, French uh, radical thinkers, and then you got uh, Rorty across the water doing an American version of it, <laughs> right? But that's what I wanted to ask you about. There's something very American about his philosophy. He's a, he's a new world type of guy, isn't he? It's very like practical. Uh, it's very much about casting off <laughs> the world of monarchy and hierarchy and gods and uh, and uh, doing it for yourself. Sort of a, a, up by the bootstraps <laughs> yeah, philosophy. Yeah, this is a, a great example of the kind of historical contingency that Rorty was so attuned to. You know, philosophy and mirror of nature, 1979. It arrives right at the moment where um, writings by the people you've mentioned, Leotard, Derrida, Foucault, you know, from the 60s and into 70s were being translated into English and arriving, you know, in American intellectual circles for the first time. So the book gets swept up into this postmodernist uh, moment where it was interpreted as this American version of deconstruction and this big critique of the modernist philosophical and, and epistemological project. And as we already talked about, there is this anti 
Cartesian anti-Kantian emphasis of philosophy mirror of nature. So the critique philosophically was very consistent with, you know, where Derrida ends up through a critique of the metaphysics of presence and where Foucault starts to think about the limits of reason in relation to madness and, and unreason. But it then a sort of break follows where Rorty and he certainly enjoyed the momentum from that reception, he starts to realize that while the philosophical critique is shared with this so-called postmodernist, they see very different implications for politics. So this is where Rorty's postmodernism, if you will, is distinctive. I think there's two, two dimensions here. One is that, as I said, he resisted the idea that there's some radical political implication of critiquing the whole foundationalist project the attempt to find philosophical backup for Enlightenment ideas. But Rorty's stance was that we can drop the philosophical justification that the uh, you know, Enlightenment thought provides, but keep Enlightenment politics, basically liberty, equality, and fraternity. And he wrote an essay in 1983 that he called Postmodernist Bourgeois Liberalism, that he later said that he understood as, a, as making a joke, but people really didn't take it that way. So he had the political difference. He wanted to argue that even if we critique the foundations, we still can embrace these philosophical ideas, which was very different from how Foucault and Derrida in particular were being interpreted by many of their followers. But he also saw a difference philosophically, and this is where pragmatism comes in. Um, he had a famous line from his Consequences of Pragmatism book, which was a collection of his essays from the 1970s, where he wrote, quote, James and Dewey were not only waiting at the end of the dialectical road which analytic philosophy traveled, but are waiting at the end of the road which, for example, Foucault and Deleuze, Gilles Deleuze, Gilles Deleuze another postmodernist, are currently traveling. So he thought philosophically, what happens after postmodernism is essentially a return to 19th century American ideas who... <laughs> right, so Walt Whitman and... <laughs> yeah, if we know Cornell West's book, uh, The American Evasion of Philosophy, we can go back to Ralph Waldo Emerson and, and start to see how ideas, European ideas, just are uh, taken up in a very different way in the context of the North American uh, political project. So, yeah, I mean, he was postmodernist in many ways, but he also ended up resisting that because of the political side. Yeah. And there was, I think as well, as I understand it, he was much more comfortable with making claims about economic justice and class justice and racial justice as well, I think, than, say, the postmodernist war. He was much more ha more comfortable saying, yeah, we need to, to do this, like a good pragmatist, I suppose, we need to do this in order to reduce inequality, in order to reduce racism. This is a really good example of how we could do this. The civil rights movement in America, Martin Luther King, that's a fantastic example of how we could reduce suffering in the world. He had a kind of a utilitarian element to him as well, but that's, I think, probably one of the other things that distinguishes him from the high priest of postmodernism, who are less prescriptive, perhaps. Yes, this, this starts to nudge us toward um, his Achieving Our Country book and his reading, this is about 1998, that the kind of politics that resulted from postmodernist commitments being translated into other areas of, of intellectual life where there are critiques of patriarchy and heteronormativity, if you like, and deconstructing all sorts of discursive constellations like phallocentrism. He started to call these cultural politics, and he saw quite early that while there had been a lot of gains in terms of challenging racism, sexism, homophobia from intellectuals that were working on this, what he termed a cultural left or postmodern left, he saw that there was also a, a dark side or a blind spot, and that it these critiques of these big historical problems that centered around privileging of white, masculine, Eurocentric ways of looking at the world were neglecting the realities of economic inequality. And he saw this quite early 
and and this is where he made a number of prophetic observations about what might come as a result of the left neglecting uh, economic issues and really being more focused on the recognition of cultural difference and otherness and things that he thought were important, but also ultimately involved detaching leftist intellectual activity from these real world struggles that were happening economically and detaching from a national electoral politics. And he saw that this really was creating uh, an opportunity for this strongman leader, uh, perhaps Donald Trump, to come along and exploit the neglect of these issues by the, the left at that time. That book, uh, I recommend folk read it, Achieving Our Country. It's a, it's a short book series of lectures, very sharp, very clear. And it's often mentioned from about 2016 onwards that Rorty, a long, long time ago, had a critique of the capacity or the inherent danger perhaps within the American democracy of going down the road of identity politics. Uh, and, I, and I don't necessarily mean like <laughs> white ethno-nationalism is identity politics <laughs> as well, right, Chris? You know, and uh, uh, as, as as he's talking about uh, the racial justice movements or homophobic movements or transgender rights, he's, I think he's worried that the fracturing, the specialization the fractionalization into, into all these different splinter groups diminishes the capacity to have a, a common narrative or a common vocabulary, perhaps. Is that right? I think that's exactly right. And and that's the way he framed identity politics. You know, on the one hand, it was, he talked about, he, he sometimes he tended to reduce all forms of injustice, you know, racial, sexual, et cetera, to issues of stigma and sadism just like beating up on on the weak. But the other way he framed it was as emphasizing the things that we don't share, difference. What distinguishes him from certain contemporary social critics on the right is that he really did understand the importance of women's studies, African-American studies, gay and lesbian studies, et cetera, and that changing the novels that are read in high school uh, and, and these things really has resulted in improvements for women, people of color, queer, et cetera. But at the same time, he said this fracturing that you're alluding to, this emphasis on what divides us rather than what we share, was going to have consequences. And we can see even how, I mean, Rorty didn't make this argument, but someone like Mark Lilla made this argument, you know, after 2016, that the structure of identity politics really lent itself to white ethnic groups inserting their own grievances as things that needed to be repaired, just like other forms of devaluation of identity and experience. Um, and he really emphasized the need for not only uh, common narratives and connections to each other, but a conception of patriotism that involved an emotional connection to one's country. And this is where, you know, it's especially when this Achieving Our Country book came out in 1998, it really wasn't well received by the left because it seemed to be this hidebound return to some sort of love of country. But for Rorty, it was really about the idea that in order to commit to improving one's country, we had to get beyond simple like self national self-mockery and self-disgust, he said. In the U.S., he, the phrase at the time was participating in the, quote, America sucks sweepstakes <laughs> and trying to, you know, provide stronger and stronger denigrations. And he thought what that results in is a kind of detachment and spectatorship that no longer has a commitment to changing the way things are and through imagining a better future. And he really thought this was essential. This is where James Baldwin, the African-American novelist and social critic, is the one who provides Rorty with the phrase achieving our country. And he used Baldwin as a model of someone who combined this emotional attachment to a country that had brought Baldwin's own ancestors in chains to a commitment to making it better. And that you can have both those things, critique and commitment or connection. And I think that's really what right. he saw as missing in the, the cultural or postmodern left of the 1990s. Well, so much interesting stuff there, Chris. Well, firstly, one of the things what you what you say there to be makes him even more American 
And far be it from me, like a sort of a, a, a European to tell America what it's, it's about, because America, I think people forget this, America is a repudiation of Europe, you know, despite all these talks about special relations and stuff like that. I think that's that's very much there. But within that, he's anti-elitist, isn't he? he? He does not like people talking down at people. And I think he was saying that his, some of his colleagues in literary departments and in universities were talking down to, to poor working class people. I think that's exactly right. He picked up on that at the time, and few few did. Where and you know some of these lines still are even uh, they hit hard today and are hard to take. But he said because it, they've now been really co opted by the right, both in um, the Americas and in Europe and beyond. Where he pointed out that yeah, it it was a great thing to create women's studies and African American studies, gay and lesbian studies. But he wrote. In achieving our country, quote, nobody is setting up a program in unemployed studies, homeless studies, or trailer <laughs> park right. studies, because the unemployed, the homeless, and residents of trailer parks are not other in the relevant sense. And that that othering even within the left, he thought, was creating that sort of hierarchy and elitism that um, today we see has blossomed into a kind of anti-intellectualism in politics and culture that is challenging, um, you know, universities and their, their reasons for being. And he saw that at the time as already underway. Other thing attached to that, I think, is for a leftist, and he very much describes himself as a leftist, a very distinct type of leftist, and he's, he inherits from Marx, he inherits from Trotsky, but he's also exceptionally critical of the more totalitarian impulses within that uh, ideology. Uh, and he's very critical of it as well. But in some sense, for a leftist, he's remarkably comfortable with talking about patriotism and talking about a love of his country. Could you perhaps speak to that or disentangle what he is saying there? Because I think it's, it's quite interesting. Just as an aside, Chris, I was talking, I was comparing like uh, Bernie Sanders the American democratic politician or democratic socialist politician, I suppose, to be more accurate, and Jeremy Corbyn, the British socialist politician. And it struck me, one of the differences, Bernie Sanders was okay with talking about America. <laughs> the British left, they tend to, if they asked him about patriotism, they tend to get themselves tied in knots. But he had a very easy way with that. So I was just wondering, would you <laughs> perhaps speak to that? I think that would be interesting. Yeah, that, that's a great parallel there. And I think that's where the the academic or cultural left uh, in the US was in the 1990s. There was... You couldn't talk about patriotism at all. But again, it's back to Rorty's idea that absent that affiliation or emotional connection, and he thought it could be not only pride, but also shame. But pride and shame both involve a vector of connection and commitment to making things better. Whereas what he was worried about was this kind of resigned pessimism and detached spectatorship. So he is comfortable with talking about the achievements of America. And he thinks without this hopeful vision for what a country can become, we really lose both the like motivational commitment and this endpoint that can drive activism today. We see this at the moment, even in the US, perhaps uh, in the UK, where the options on the table politically in terms of electoral politics can lead people just to say, you know what, I'm just going to not vote. I'm going to just step aside, tune out. And, tune out. and that was his biggest worry. Cynicism. Yeah. yeah cynicism. Yeah, yeah. Which was, I think he thought was quite corrosive, well, not even to the individual, but to the body politic as, as, as well. I just want to circle back because we haven't really talked about contingency irony solidarity. And great title again in that there's he gives us almost virtues and uh, that's one of the that's one of the first books i read on my own of philosophy that i came across and found and i thought wow this is amazing you're you're you're, you're allowed to do philosophy like this i remember feeling at the time because i come from a quite, uh, traditionally analytic philosophical training i think and a little bit of continental philosophy but then i started reading this i thought it was great i wrote my undergraduate dissertation on it which you'll be which turned into, believe it or not, Chris turned into like a Marxist critique of Rorty. I'll tell you what I was like when I was 19. I, I, was kind of, I cringe now because it was like, you know, as if he hadn't thought of it. Like, you know. But anyway, that, that's, uh, but that book, it's a great book, a remarkable book. And it's, I wanted to ask you about it and what the virtues of it are, or what's his constructive view of how we relate together as human beings. I think the, the core of it, and correct me if I'm wrong, is about cruelty. And sort of cruelty is the thing that we need to avoid. And solidarity, I suppose, is the the palliative to, to, to cruelty. 
Right. Yeah. That um, that idea about cruelty, I think he he gets from political theorist Judith Schlar and the idea that being a liberal, and, and this is, you know, definitive for Rorty in terms of his own liberalism, means that the commitment to ending suffering and ending cruelty really becomes the highest moral and political uh, priority. So Contingency, Irony, and Solidarity, right, it's such an interesting book. It's odd. Rorty himself thought it was his most original work and the one that was like sort of most expressive of of him and his views. But as you know, it, it wasn't well received by philosophers on the one hand. Uh, but on the other hand, I, I've heard many times people from our generation or even older how that book allowed them to see that it was possible to do philosophy right. in a different mode that wasn't analytical. And interestingly, especially women philosophers who thought they had been completely turned off by the the analytic tradition that Rorty opened to space. I mean, Nancy Fraser, for example, writes explicitly about this, that that book helped her not quit philosophy. Um, <laughs> So there's a lot going on there. I have it for that. Yeah. Let's see. I mean, there's a philosophical part and then kind of the, the moral and political part of it. And he's, this is 1989. He's starting to work out the consequences or the implications of his critique of the, the dominant, you know, philosophical tradition in philosophy mirror of nature for politics and culture. And he gives us, because he hadn't really provided this in a positive way, the last third of philosophy mirror of nature is sort of scattered by his own admission and reaching. And he's trying to figure out what philosophy might look like outside of this dominant Cartesian Kantian model. And it's perhaps in contingency irony and solidarity that he gives us an example of what it might look like. Now, on the one hand, and, and, uh, and we've had some internal arguments within people who write on Rorty, whether we view philosophy, uh, contingency irony and solidarity as explicitly disavowing philosophy. You know, he writes about in the introduction there, a turn away from theory and towards narrative, or is he actually giving us an example of a new and different way to do philosophy? So we get an account of language that he draws from Donald Davidson, contemporary thinker who Rorty read as a pragmatist, who didn't always think of himself that way, Davidson and Wittgenstein. So language becomes a tool rather than a medium of representation. Right. Uh, he gives us a view of the self that he derives from Nietzsche and Freud as being contingent and constructed rather than expressing some universal human essence. And then he gives a view of morality that derives from 20th century thinker Wilfred Sellers that involves what Sellers called we intention, rather than a Kantian transcendental conception of morality, one that derives from the intentions of a community. So it gives Rorty a way to redefine all these ideas, philosophical concepts, in a way consistent with the kind of pragmatism that's going to start with their communities, our ways of life, our, our languages, and then build out from there. And that's the solidarity, isn't it, of the contingency, the irony and the solidarity. This, yes. That's probably why he took flack from the left as well in Marxist, because he's usually, for the Marxists, if I recall, he's usually seen as a a bit milk toast, basically, but sort of a, a bit of sort of like a soft, soft Marxist, soft, you know, soft economic justice. And I, I was talking about this with a friend actually recently, with one of my colleagues, and they were saying like, I was like thinking... Yeah, he's talking about pragmatism, you know, and he's talking about, you know, not having too, being too left, not being too right. And I was thinking, isn't that in the water at the time? Isn't that kind of big Clinton American politicals like Tony Blair in the UK? Isn't that, isn't that there? Well, I don't think that's what he means, but um, yeah. I mean, well, let me just say, what does he mean by solidarity then? What does that look like? Yeah, that's a great point. And, and I think my own early work on Rorty was very critical as well, because it felt like he wasn't following through the implications of his philosophical critiques to get a more radical economic policy, a more radical politics. But he resisted that. And I think his, you know, his conception of solidarity, I mean, it comes up in that book, you know, the latter parts are quite kind of miscellaneous where you have, you know, um, Derrida, you have Proust, you have Nietzsche, right, Nietzsche, Heidegger, um, and also Nabokov and, and George Orwell. I mean, some have said it was just Rorty's vehicle for writing about his favorite, you know, <laughs> thinkers. Wrong with that. 
Right. Nothing wrong with that. In fact, he really offered a model for how to do that in an intellectual way that gets beyond, let's say, literary, uh, narrow literary critiques. Um, but he really, his view of so solidarity, I think, was quite thin. You know, he distinguished his own stance from what, remember from the 1980s and 90s, the communitarian yeah. views that positive uh, posited a much stronger sense of community that sometimes was too homogeneous and hostile to difference. Rorty's conception of solidarity, which he also develops in later essays like Justice as a Larger Loyalty, is enough felt attachment to others that we're willing to take action to alleviate their pain or suffering. So it's a solidarity that has no higher threshold than an ability to experience pain, you know, and injustices and larger loyalty extends it beyond, beyond humans to like the cows and the kangaroos, he says, maybe even the trees, that we can think about reducing suffering as this overarching circle of moral concern. Which is why cruelty is the ultimate vice. It is for Rorty, yeah. And I think that gives you a kind of solidarity that, you know, um, isn't quite as scary or, you know, problematic is stronger versions. Um, but, you know, it, it, he's on a sort of a thin um, plank there. Uh, but I think that's where he's trying to establish his moral and political project. I only got two more questions, if that's OK. But one of them is about Obama uh, that I wanted to put to you is because what, what year did Rorty die? Is it 2004? 2007. 2007. Yeah. Okay, 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 yeah. okay, okay. So would he have been aware of the Obama campaign? You know, he wasn't. Rorty's lifelong friend, Richard J. Bernstein, you know, who was my teacher, we talked about it often that the 2008 campaign of Obama with its motto, you know, yes, we can, that this was right out of Rorty's playbook that had an envision, a vision that involved creating hope that focused on, you know, what brings people together rather than, you know, differences that need to be celebrated that can still divide people. And that ironically, I mean, Rorty ended his life in probably the most pessimistic stance that he had because he was really worried about the erosions of liberty that were happening in the name of protecting us from terrorism in the wake of September 11. You didn't live to see this Obama campaign and the criticisms of Obama, particularly in the U.S., from people like a Rorty's student, you know, Cornell West, who, <laughs> as it happens, has presented himself as a candidate for the uh, president election next year. Yeah. Cornell West was quite critical of Obama, um, in part because he wasn't radical enough in his language about racial injustice. But I think this is where... Rorty is vulnerable to the same critique, if you will, but perhaps this is a virtue where they didn't want to reduce efforts to remedy racial injustice to race specific policies. You know, and this is in line with, as you said, Dr. Martin Luther King's later work in, in the Poor People's Campaign that really was a project designed to address racial injustice by Af experienced by African Americans, but doing so in a way that would try to raise all all boats. And this was, I think, very Rorian in, in that way. I could imagine, well, you know what they say, I can't remember who it was, was, I think it was one of your governors, Governor Cuomo, I think, was it? He said that you campaign in poetry and you govern in prose. Right. <laughs> I, I think perhaps Rorty might have been infatuated or well, maybe have a critical disposition, but quite delighted by the Obama campaign and what the country voted for, especially after the, the Bush years and all those things that he was wrote about, uh, the the peeling back of civil, civil liberties, uh, the Patriot Act and things like that. But he may have been a bit, he may have been despite with the Obama presidency, perhaps. Yeah, that's, you know, that's a really interesting question. I mean... Um, it's a bit of a counterfactual, I guess, so we can't really add to it, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> As I mentioned, Richard Bernstein, his lifelong friend, you know, he viewed the difference between he and Rorty, which wasn't huge philosophically, but that in the 1960s, uh, Bernstein was down in the South, you know, in Mississippi and taking part in civil rights movements. And Rorty, I mean, he participated in some labor movements and sit-ins, but he really was a kind of big state liberal, you know, and, and looking 
maybe that that was part of the Clinton uh, stuff, but Rooseveltian liberal, perhaps. Rose, yeah, and it really wasn't so much a, a social movement politics, but rather using the state to remedy injustice for sure, but not in you know a kind of radical way. And so, how Obama, the Obama presidency, plays out, it's hard to figure where Rorty would come down on. Uh, but I certainly they shared more than um, than divided them. Gets me to the last question I want to ask you, and I want to talk about the question of naivety and uh, idealism, because he is a he is a pragmatist, and and in some way, Chris, I think Rorty is a real real he's a realist as well, you know. Uh, but in, and he's because he's constantly coming up with ideas and potential policies uh, that will practically change the world for the better, that will reduce suffering. Um, and then sometimes you think that's really right. And other times he sounds quite naive. The, the essay I wanted to ask you about was that struck me was the, um, it's in your edited collection, What Can We Hope For? Essays of Politics, Richard Rorty. The essay is Half a Million Blue Helmets. Half a Million Blue Helmets, question mark. And at some level, he, he says, what we need to solve <laughs> problems in the Middle East uh, are half a million blue helmets. And uh, what I'm, I'm like going, don't hold your breath, <laughs> right? But at another level, he's quite like trying to come up with concrete, practical things, realistic things. Well, he's like, what can make that situation better? What What are your thoughts on the naivety, realist, uh, divided Rorty? Yeah, you know, that's really interesting that you're putting your finger on there. And I think I agree that both those things are present. I mean, the naivete and the idealism. On the one hand, he tried to cut through debates and, you know, partisanship by pr proposing these practical solutions that he thought people could get behind. And he took pride in that. And very often he was insightful and original. But at other times, as you know, it just seems awfully simplistic and naive. And sometimes it seemed like he was sacrificing some of his larger commitments just for some political efficacy that could come about. In the case of the, the Blue Helmets, I mean, I think Rorty was active with things like Amnesty International. I think he was really impacted by time he spent in the former Yugoslavia and things that he witnessed there in terms of, you know, the ethnic cleansing that happened. And he did perhaps, you know, cling to this notion if we had only had this UN global police force that we could have intervened. But as you point out, I'm not sure if, if that's really a solution. Q and are going to love that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, today, I mean, it seems even, even more far-fetched perhaps, but it, maybe that was almost like a backward-looking sentiment that if only in Rwanda or Bosnia, we had had right. a few more people on the ground that violence could have been prevented. And that's probably the, the naive part, the idealistic part. And um, he wasn't always as like um, hard hitting, you know, in some of these proposals as others. Your, your essay collection, and I recommend people folk bias, what can we hope for? That question, you know, we're, we're having this conversation, uh, in, 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 I guess, the backdrop of the uh, the recent uh, terrorist attacks in Israel, and uh, it's a very, very bleak time in the, in the world of the Middle East. Uh, what can we hope for then, Chris? Right. I mean, this, what a great question. I mean, I think for Rorty, the, you know, the hope comes with the possibilities for change and reform that new ideas, new metaphors can bring that often are unpredictable and unexpected. I just happened to read an article this morning uh, by David Brooks here in the U.S., uh, looking back to, again, Clinton and the opportunities for getting some kind of peace accord through the U.S., you know, kind of um, diplomacy of, uh, you know, when Arafat was there and, and et cetera, Itzhak Rabin, and that there were so many opportunities where the center and the people who were working for, you know, this kind of middle, were upended and disrupted by the extremes, you know? So for, I think Rorty, for Rorty, the, the hope comes not so much in these radical solutions, but the, the faith that piecemeal reformism, even in the bleakest moments, has potential. And that people coming together, even on the thinnest planks of agreement, can really be the basis for 
achieving something lasting. And we, you know, there were many opportunities that, that David Brooks recounted where it was on the table. It was like 95% of what each side had been asking for, yet the deals were never closed because, you know, Rabin was assassinated and, and the extremists. So I think that it really, the hope, uh, I think, can come from the importance of people coming together in a broad center to resist the extremes that really are dominating so much of our our discourse and and political scene today i think that's a that's a really good place to end it thank you chris thank you patrick i I really enjoyed the conversation Mm